I thought I would begin my remarks this morning by making a confession. And that is, I have never been to the state of Alabama before. <laughs> despite, despite growing up in nearby Florida and having a mother, aunt, and uncle who are all proud graduates of Tuskegee University, <laughs> despite having a godmother who lives in Birmingham and is here with me today, I have to admit, this is my very first time visiting this great state. Now, I don't want you to get the wrong impression. I am not unfamiliar with this community or what has happened here. I wanna assure you that I actually do know a lot about Alabama, and in particular, about its critical connection to the civil rights struggles of African Americans during the 1950s and 1960s. So while I've not been to Alabama, I can quite confidently say that I know Alabama. And if you knew my parents, you would understand why. You see, my parents are African Americans who grew up in South Florida at a time of racial segregation. They came of age during the civil rights movement and they chose to enter the field of education after graduating from historically black colleges and universities in the late 1960s. They were public school teachers when I was born. Now these facts are important to know because my parents were deeply committed to my education, knowledge and well-being when I was a child. And it is also quite clear that my parents viewed my entry into this world in September of 1970 as a genuine opportunity to nurture the long denied American dream. Good everything, Dr. Carr. That might be a good place to start. Happy, happy uh, in class with Carr, happy everything. Good morning to you. Good everything. So good to see you always. How are you feeling this morning, Professor Hunter? Very reflective. You know, I, I spent some time at the water this week and um and, and a walkthrough for Healthy Wealthy Wise. I I um something happened and I realized, you know, so I wanted to have the experience. I think everyone, you know, I wanted to walk through so that I can feel what that experience is gonna be for people. Cause I hadn't done that previously. Right. And so, you know, I would just show up to the venue and it's like, no, I want to walk through every single, I want to be in every room. I want to touch, so, you know, I want to touch the experience. I want to craft the experience. Cause I'm, I'm a visual. Absolutely. Oh, you're muted. My mic went out. Uh, so, I, you know, I have to see it in my mind's eye in order to manifest it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to feel and see this, this thing. And, um, I realized something that I, I haven't spent a lot of time inside. Well, I do spend a lot of time in my head, but I was like the collective, you know, so when I saw the, the topic today, I smiled um, because you sent me down a rabbit hole of trauma. So I want to say thank you because I don't think, I think we spend more time avoiding trauma uh, and not, not that it's avoidable because it's, it's every day. And then there's the epigenetics, right? So I was like, I've just been in deep thought this morning. So um, mm. yeah. Let's stay there. Okay. All right. Yeah, um, let's stay there. Before, well, go ahead. No, no, you you go. I I know you you're like the rhythm is different. The rhythm is different. Yeah. Um, when we, when we you logged on a few minutes ago, so everything is was wonderful, but I could feel your spirit. And it's not a heaviness. It's not a heaviness. I I think what it is maybe maybe I'm um maybe I'm hoping something that I don't, I, I can't make happen. Right. So, you know, um, I, I pride myself on making things happen, but I, I don't know if I can make this happen. And so, you know, as we sit with, with the little girls and, and the whole entire community, 16th street Baptist church, where, where uh, justice Kentaji Brown Jackson was speaking, you know, I, I'm thinking about our collective trauma. You know, individually, uh, I got up this morning and also watched Kirk Franklin. Maybe that's it, too. I watched his documentary. Why did I do that this morning? Oh. Why did I do that? You, have, you know, I'm doing joyful things. And I was like, man, this guy got me in here. Talk about something. Yeah. So I guess maybe we shouldn't be talking about this. No, we shouldn't talk about this. this for Monday. No, they just, they just, they just helping to guide because... Um, 
yeah, it's a good speech. It's all good speech. It's it's yeah. it's it's nitroglycerin though. Yeah, because what you know when I was listening to his story, which is probably um, the YouTube uh, documentary uh, Father's Day, Kirk Franklin's mm-hmm. most brilliant um, album release marketing I've ever seen in in a while. It's brilliant. Um, but I was thinking, I, I don't know what it feels like to not be loved by my parents, and how privileged that is to know that I was wanted, loved. You know, my dad would tell me all the time, you didn't ask to be here. So I'm going to make sure you have everything you want. My my grandmother, mm-hmm. when I would go down south in, to Augusta, not too far from where I was in, in Charleston. Um, oh, my God. I was her first grandchild. So, you know, I was spoiled. No question. They poured oh into you. That's why let's oh pour into us the way they poured into you. Yeah. So, I mean, so it's easy for me to to see a heavenly father. Cause I had one on earth, you know, it's easy for me to understand what it means to be loved and to love people, to love people unconditionally and to really want the best for people. Cause I had that, you know, but if you didn't have it, you know, what does it look like? And then collectively, you know, that African saying, you know, a child will burn down the village to feel warmth, you know, if they don't have it, you know? So like, are we, you know, in that collective lack of love as we seek it? And then how do we act out as a result of it towards each other? towards the world around us for even ourselves, you know, the a high rate of disease that is rampant based on behavior that is rooted in not self-like, you know, um, be honest about it. So like, how does that play out? And then every day we're inundated with these images of like trauma against our bodies just because we're black, you know, how we just show up in the office place. And, and, and you know, I just saw the police uh, break up a fight where they punched a woman in the face and then people started swinging on them and nobody got shot, tasered or anything. I was like, all white people. All white people. I was like, wow. Mm-hmm. Y'all, y'all could de-escalate and, and they were wrong. The cops were wrong. They, they came well, in. They were, but nobody died. Nobody died. Nobody died. So you can value life. I watched white people pull a shark from the beach in a video. They cared about that shark. The shark was like thrashing the teeth with thousand teeth. They could be, they were not, they pulled, they got together and pulled the shark back into the water. I said, you could care about things, people. About, you can about. care about living things. Meanwhile, in the Buckhead Vine City part of Atlanta, a 23-year-old cop, HBCU graduate, kills a, an elder, a deacon in the church because of a traffic ticket that the man said he didn't want to sign. So here come this young boy. As my friend Molly Davis, who's representing the family, uh, attorney Davis said, you forgot all your home training, all your protocol. You out here black, you done put on some blue uniform and now, now an elder is dead because you decided, you know. So you, sir, should be punished to the fullest extent of our community after law, because you seem to think you're the law. But when it's white people, yeah, you punch a cop dead ass in the face. Yeah. Walk away. So I just, you know, I was thinking about that this morning too. I'm like, so Mm -hmm. when does it end? And then what is the work that is required? Because for more than anything, like we can, these sessions uh, now 184 straight, um, I think about, yeah, first of all, the consistency of that, Mm -hmm. we don't see. Um, But the goal here is to learn so that you can grow, to learn so that you can share. That's right. To learn so that you can leave the world better than the way you found it. but the learning, the knowing starts with you, right? So mm-hmm. we 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 piece these things together as breadcrumbs so that you can find your path. But you know, are people doing the work or is this, you know? Well, we know people do so. we do to our socialization, our capacity and to our um mobility and context. I mean, we, you know, during the the the, the terror of COVID, which is coming back in a different form. Uh, just as the, the new vaccine is ready, but uh, not that I believe this. There's a long article in the New Yorker this week. What you saying? On, what you saying? <laughs> there was a long article this week uh, in the New Yorker on Ross Duhat, who's a, uh, an op-ed writer for the New York Times and also um, a, a right winger. But they talked about how he soft pedals it and how, how he's palpable in this liberal environment, being able to say things that hint toward perhaps vaccines cause autism or that hint toward perhaps they're UFOs. And it hint toward. And I'm sitting here watching this beautifully written piece about how a white man can be a nut 
and be embraced and be allowed on the pages of the New York Times. And so if Ross Duhat was to say that, oh, yeah, it looks like the COVID uh, new strain has come just in time for the new uh, vaccines to enrich the companies further. Uh, no one would bat an eye. They would say, well, he's just representing the voices. But if you say it, then they cast you to the nether regions and say, here's here's crazy Karen Hunter on the radio telling millions of people not to get vaccinated. I didn't say that. Oh, I can't. I wasn't born a white man, though. So I can't just talk out the both sides of my neck, mouth and any other orifice. Ass. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, for sure. Yeah, but you know, I mean, but what you're saying is so important because you know, when do we? When you say, you know, are people doing the work? Well, we began this regular metronome during a period when people were many people were required to stay home. And now that the world has opened back up and capitalism and everything else tries to claw at us, it we remain consistent. And there are a lot of people who have. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and when, when I say things, let me just say, I'm not, there's not a finger pointing except at oh, me. No, not at all. You know, like I'm always questioning, am I doing enough? Am I doing the work? You yeah. know, are there things I need to, you know, work on in my character? Are there things, you know, like I had an epiphany this week about, you know, that, meta, what is it, meta nefer? Is it good speech? Yes, yes, yeah. that's it, good speech. And, you know, I was complaining about some things. I'm going to talk about it on Monday with Dr. Black, but I was complaining about some people, Dr. Carr. Mm -hmm. And then I made a decision partly mm -hmm. being in that water, that what if I spoke life into them? What right. if I prayed for them? What if I said nice things instead of the, the things that I'm saying based on their behavior? So I feel justified, right? <laughs> so course. I switched it up. I switched it up. And you know what happened, Dr. Carr? Mm. It switched up. No question. So It I always said, does. Wait a minute. It All does. I had to do was stop talking bad about these people for them to do it. It's like, All it does. It, yeah. does, it always does. It, so, it, in fact, their behavior is of less consequence. That energy shifts. Yes. I watched it happen. So I was like, okay, note to self. I'm going to plant seeds instead of trying to pull up weeds. Mm. <sighs> so what did you think about our newest U.S. Supreme Court Justice, Katanji Brown Jackson, her, her, her opening remarks there at 16th Street Baptist Church? That, that capped a week of activities in Birmingham around the 60th uh, anniversary of the murder of six children in Birmingham. Would you have any thoughts about that? And I know, and I'm gonna, let me pull up the live YouTube. I got the uh, narrative up so I can see how, what people are saying, some people. We didn't see but a glimpse, but just a look. Yeah, and I'm gonna do just the opposite because I the, the, the YouTube is up naturally. I'm gonna pull up the, okay. the narrative right now. Um. You know, my initial, because I'm, um, you know, I got, I got thoughts. Um, I, no, I'm glad she showed up. No question. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm like tired of speeches. I don't know anybody. I just, can you just talk to us? And I'm, I'm glad. I know things have to have an order. You know, we mm -hmm. have to have. I just, how do you really feel? You know, like I got oh, I oh, questions. I really feel. Yeah, because you know, if, if you if you think about the bombing and and what was meant by blowing up a church, these good Christian, these evangelicals in the South, these good white Christians, you know, <laughs> whiter than snow, Absolutely. blowing up a church, you think about what that means and how this country is being blown up by those same people today. Oh no, question. blown up, you know, to preserve what exactly? Not Christ, not no. God, not anything good, right? And in and some she, cases, literally, some of the people still around. Yeah. And and she's, you know, sitting on a court that is dismantling everything. Oh, no question. And so I'm looking at a, a speech that was, you know, was it 20 something minutes? Yeah. yeah. Not very long at all. A little over 20, maybe about 25 minutes or so. Okay. Yeah. Was yeah. there was there a discussion of you know the dismantling of of because really that was in in reaction to black people demanding rights. <laughs> they right. weren't asking for your property or your children. They were they were coming for your community or your town. They just said, uh, uh, "I'd like to be able to eat at a counter, not drink from a a nasty water fountain that has colors on it. Uh, I want to be able to vote." Uh, can I vote? I mean, because you know I'm paying taxes. No can question. I vote? Please, can I vote? That was that was the ask, right, Doctor Carr? Wasn't was giving your country yeah. your 
your children and your women. And no, it was. I, I don't want to sit next to your little children in the classroom. I want my class. I want my school to be nice. As the brother told uh, Horace Tate in the Lost Education, the Horace Tate will be reading that in about a month in my Education in Black America class. I'm looking for my copy. I ran somewhere. He came up to the school, as they say, there in Georgia, and he asked Principal Tate, Horace Tate, he said, Mr. Tate, all I want is a bus for my children to be able to ride and now walk. I didn't say I wanted to go sit in the white school. In fact, I would prefer not to sit in the white school. As the as the Africans told Rufus Sexton and Oliver Otis Howard and Sherman, General Sherman in South Carolina, where you just came from, when they when the Union Army came there in 1862. And they were like, well, what do you want? We want two things. We want land. And then when he said, well, they said, well, if you want land, okay, fine. Uh, do, would you rather be dispersed among the whites? Would you rather live in a kind of community with them? And they said, no, we want land and we want to be left alone. And that was the origin, as Mike Harriet wrote uh, a couple of weeks ago. But when you read Rehearsal for Reconstruction, Willie Lee Rose, uh, when you read Yankee Stepfather, which is by William McFeely, what you see is that 40 acres and a mule was a black idea. After they told them that, that's when Sherman and them went back and said, okay, we're going to give y'all 40 acres. But they said, we want land and we want you to leave us alone. That was the origin of 40 acres and the mule. What's well, not a white idea? We just want to be left alone. <laughs> can, can we Can we just be left alone? <laughs> you know? what, what about that? It's so disturbing that you want to blow up, you know, decimate towns, blow up churches, lynch people. You know, what What about that creates that kind of anger well, and ire? And it's terror. very unsettling. I can't control you. I can't tell you what to do. So, you know, and then and then, of course, there's the propaganda machine, which is unfortunately fed often by us, uh, whether it be the 1950s, 40s, 30s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s and forward to today, because some of us do want to be let in. I mean, Justice Brown Jackson, brilliant, waging war, uh, Harvard Law, never been to the state of Alabama. Her own mom and auntie went to Tuskegee. She said, I've never been to Alabama, but I know Alabama. No, you don't know Alabama, Justice, with all due respect. I mean, I ain't mad at you because <laughs> I think if you know Alabama, you might have made some different choices, maybe personal, I don't know, professional, who knows. But the point is this, <laughs> uh, I ain't mad at you. Brilliant, fighting for us. I cape for Katanji Onyika Brown Jackson. This is not a criticism of her. What it is is a recognition, though, that the way African people in this country have been narrated, including by Black folk, has been that we somehow lusted after entry into this social structure at the price of losing the momentum of our own memory, at the price of perhaps uh, trying to fit our ways of knowing into these alien ways of knowing. That's the illusion. And so that triggers uh, a sense of entitlement among white people, particularly poor whites who have nothing but their whiteness. And so that leads them to stick dynamite up under the corner of 16th Street Baptist Church or blow up, try to blow up A.C. Gaston's hotel or turn around and try to blow up something that we can't. I mean, that's the thing. But then the other thing that that, that triggers white nastiness and white supremacists is leave us alone. Because that's I think that's the real fear. The real fear is that we continue building our own self-determining spaces. That's what happened in, you know, with the NFL, with Colin Kaepernick. He had to put down a rebellion. Why, you Negroes, next thing you know, you'll be trying to start your own league. You know, this is the great retort of the poor whites. This is a great retort of the rich whites. This is the great retort of whiteness in general. Why don't you go back to Africa? Shit, if we went back to Africa, you all would be dead in 10 years. And not just because you wouldn't have nobody do the work for you over here, but because we went back to Africa and strengthened what we need to do, everything on the planet would have to change, including this funky little settler discourse you call the United States of America. So, you know, we can't imagine that. And then, of course, even even in a nominal sense, you know, you're going to build out some black colleges and compete with us athletics. No, buy that Negro. We need him dancing on sidelines in Boulder with the Wu-Tang Clan sitting up there. We get that back in order now. Don't mess around with that fool. Mm. We need him arguing over hats and sunglasses or something and giving out sunglasses at halftime. I don't know. But my point is this. What you can't do is let them Negroes go back and have their own institutions. And we're going to tell the story in a way so that their children will believe the whole the whole reason they protested and fought and died in the 1950s and 60s was to send uh some football players to tuscaloosa in auburn alabama and uh, a couple of people at the law school 
And then they can stand up and say, see, look at the progress we've made in moving toward the promise of America. That's some bullshit. Pure bread. <laughs> and if anybody want to debate it, let's dance, please. This is why we have Nubia. Come on in. Let's have a conversation about it. Let's put as, yeah, anyway. But, but that, let me, let me, good speech. Let, let me do this before we do anything else. Before we do anything else. I, uh, the first time, the only time I've been to Brazil, we were in, uh, Salvador Bahia back in 2005 to talk with school teachers and um we you know went down there to talk about curriculum this was around the time we were beginning to develop that African American uh history course for Philadelphia public schools and we were writing that curriculum and so in the middle of that some of us were invited down to talk with teachers in Brazil and school children it was a remarkable moment and you know, our, our brother Cedric Miles sent us sent us with images from our Freedom Schools family. And so we were showing these images in, in the opening moment just to let, you know, them know that you got cousins uh, north. And it was fascinating. And that in some ways, that circle came full circle, that 18 year ago circle this past week. In fact, they're still here in the States, as uh, brother said, told us a few weeks ago. He and uh, an intrepid band of Afro-Brazilians from uh, Salvador, Bahia, the Atlantic Archives, the Leila Gonzalez Project. Leila Gonzalez was a powerful liberation fighter, politician, intellectual in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, 90s, until she made transition, I think, in 1994. Uh, they came to the United States. They've been here for a little over a week. They're down in South Carolina. Uh, they were in Orangeburg yesterday with Kathy Adams and the family there, Baba Bernie Gallman, Baba Derek, and the folks from the Comedic Institute down there. Uh, just a just a beautiful convening. Cat uh, sent some pictures. And on Monday they were here in D.C. Uh, they got a chance to uh, come to D.C. They came to campus, and then they came over. They well, they didn't meet. They met me on campus. They came. I don't usually teach on Mondays. Uh, my days and the rest of the week, but that, uh, you know, after they took the freshman seminar for us, uh, from us, somehow they still want me to come over and, and give a talk at the freshman seminar. I think that's cute. So, you know, again, thinking about the greater good and setting aside the, the, the silly politics of petty bourgeois Negro, them, I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll come talk to the young people. So I did, and I invited them to come. They were coming around the same time. So they did. And then we, got into the work. We walked across the street to Sankofa and Holly Greenman was there. He was working as usual on his films and he took a break, came out and talked with them and they, and let, let him, uh, let them interview him. And it was very powerful. Cedric did most of the questions and then the young people continued to ask questions. And then one of the last questions uh, they asked was, did you know Leila Gonzalez, this, this huge figure? He said, yeah, I did. And you could have heard a pin drop. Like, you knew her? Oh, yeah. My wife and I, Sharik, we knew her. We would see her in, in Dakar, Senegal, Kenya. You see her all over. We'd sit up. She was part of a study group. You know, we talk about Amakar Cabral. She read Cabral in the Portuguese because, of course, she, you know, that was the foreign tongue that had been placed in the mouth of the Africans in Brazil. And we know Brazil, of course, is the largest number of black people in the world after Nigeria. Nigeria is the country with the large number of Africans in the world. Number two is Brazil. And so it was just a very powerful moment. And it kind of brought full circle. I told them, I said, you know, when we when, when, when I came to Salvador, when I came to your city, uh, I was armed, among other things, with images of our people. All of those young people are now adults. Many of them have children of their own. Uh, and, you know, some of them, some of their children may be close to some of y'all's age, but they were teenagers. When I came down here, Cedric is the one who took those pictures. And it was just a very, very powerful, powerful moment. Mm. Mm -hmm. Erica in the chat says that her daughter was in your class on Monday. She said it was the best class. In oh, <laughs> hey, Erica. The best. I am tripping. Listen, one of those two, oh my goodness. I, I will say that this has been, I have never, well, I guess it's just going to get more and more until I move to another institution. But thank you, Erica, because there were several who, came up and said that they were Nubians or their parents are. And then there was one young lady that said that, um, 
you know, my 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 mother was your student when she graduated in 2003. I said, oh, my God. Now I know <laughs> your mother, that's when they when when, they, when the children start coming, saying a mom was your so your their father was. And, you know, and now there are, you know, I got a couple of. Uh, nieces, you know, the, the, the and nephews, daughters and sons of um, of classmates, comrades, brothers and sisters and struggle that we have, or as you might put it in that category, because there are very few when you see a confidant. Uh, Sister G for her mom is Marimba Ani, of course. Her her, her grand uh, Mama Rimba's granddaughter is 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 a freshman. How her child tracked me down, came into class. I'm like, my goodness, I cannot believe it. You know, I mean, because this this is the nature of of what we're doing, and so yeah, I'm I'm grateful, and and including the staff and faculty who come up and say. We're newbies. Okay. You ain't got to whisper, but you can whisper. Why? Because the jailbreaking the black university is a real thing. <laughs> and let's, let me, and let's not gloss over this. No, we're not. No. The, 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 <clears throat> that you have been intentional from the very beginning about what it is that you want to put into this world. Absolutely. And it was about this and it hasn't stopped. And it's been 25 plus years of this and it hasn't stopped because this is who you are. And this is why you were put here. So I just want to say thank you for that. That's oh, it. yeah. I th thank you, Rob. Thank you. Thank you. Because it's, and as, as I tell students all the time, and we're going to talk about students today in terms of Birmingham, because we opened with Birmingham. We're going to stay in that rhythm, maybe, because this is the 60th anniversary. But I tell them all the time, when you see me, when you see a Karen Hunter, when you see a, a Cedric Miles or a Kathy Adams, when you see a Dan Black, we see a brother Reyes, Bobby Reyes, when we see a Baba Eyes, what we're seeing is the people who poured into us. So when you say that you were the only grandchild and those they spoiled you, yeah, I think the social structure would call it spoiling. But in our ways of knowing, they were pouring into you. They poured into you. And now you pouring into us. So when we see you, we see them. There's no more powerful testament to the power of our ancestors than when we move through the world in ways that we can't help but move through the world because they poured in us. And so, yeah, Kataji Brown Jackson never been physically to Alabama, but as she said, her people poured into her, her parents poured into her, school teachers, both of them, HBCU graduates, both of them, Mamanati Tuskegee Brig poured into her. And so when she's doing battle with these under uh, underdeveloped, uh, and I mean intellectually, culturally, morally, ethically, people like uh, Justice Beer Kavanaugh, um, who very, very well may side with the white nationalists in the state of Alabama to attempt to continue to eviscerate and maybe even destroy this, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. We see they were ordered by the Supreme Court to redraw the congressional districts. There are seven in Alabama and to create another district that was majority black because Alabama is about a third black the census numbers put it at around i think 28 percent, which you can pretty much just say it's about a third black we know they undercount but of course they just drew the maps they emptied almost exactly the same as they did before and dared the courts to do something about it the federal district court said this is absurd now you got to appoint an independent commission to redraw of course they appeal they'll be appealing to the circuit court there and then to the Supreme Court, ultimately, if they lose at the, at the I'm sorry, the uh, yeah, the Circuit Court, after they uh, win or lose there, if they lose, they'll appeal to their map to their friends, and Beer Kavanaugh may be the deciding vote because Beer Kavanaugh wrote in dissent, or actually knowing concurrence to the voting rights case and the Mulligan case, that the case as it presented itself did not have for lack of a better term, the, the correct kind of focus. He said, perhaps the Voting Rights Act, this is, this is, he's alluding to the idea that the Voting Rights Act perhaps has outlived its usefulness. I mean, this is after all the poison pill that Sandra Day O'Connor put in affirmative action when she said maybe another 25 years. Well, Beer Kavanaugh may be ready to end the Voting Rights Act now. And these defiant Alabamans, have decided that maybe we'll take another bite of the apple. And so Kataji Brown Jackson will, if that is the case, of course, be writing in dissent. And one of the reasons she's writing in dissent is because her whole life has been grounded in the importance of fighting 
for our common humanity. And it was grounded in a black foundation by two Florida born and bred parents, as she mentioned there in that small clip of what we saw in her remarks at 16th Street Baptist Church. So, yeah, in 2005, I went to Salvador and it's been too, far too long. I told him I'll be back down there and said brought the crew up here and we're sitting there. But I remember when I was there. I came back, of course, had to give a full report to the Freedom School students because we're in Freedom Summer. And I brought back a little bell because we were poor libation, beginning of our rituals, our regular Wednesday reading rituals, as they would fan that all over the city. But on Wednesdays, we bring them all together and do our common text, the book we would read every a different book, every song. And I remember saying, you know, there are many ways to do libation. There are many ways to call ancestors and to invite them into the space. And one of them, sometimes in many rituals, you will ring a bell. So I would ring the bell, right? There's my little, my little bell, right? And the little tint, the little tinser is on it. So I won't tease it here. I kind of keep it around now. There it is. Ring the bell. You say, I go, I go, I go. Almost like, are you here? Can you hear? Are you listening? And then the response is, I may. So we hear a lot of people do that in after school programs, rights of passage programs. Say, I go. Everybody say, I may. Now everybody's quiet. But when you're calling ancestors, you just say, I go. The I may, you can feel them coming. Right. So this isn't the bell from Brazil. This is a bell that I actually um, got from a Nigerian elder, a Yoruba man. Uh, not too long ago, we were having a conversation about the Odu Ifa and we were talking, we were talking. And so he said, take this. I said, oh, good. This is a bell I'll put on my desk and use. I want to ring this bell this morning for six young people who lost their lives on september the 15th who 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 went into the ancestral realm too early on september 15th 1963 addie may collins 14 Ashel, carol denise mcnair 11 Ashel, carol robeson 14 Ashel. Johnny Robinson, 16, Ashel, Virgil Ware, 13, Ashel, and Cynthia Dion Wesley, 14, Ashel, I go, I go. We often narrate Collins McNair, Roberson, and Wesley as the four little girls, but three of them were teenagers. They are narrated as innocents, as if any human could somehow earn their death and yet to be innocent, not to be killed. We pause here and lift up the 11,000 and counting who were not accounted for in Libya, many of them swept into the Mediterranean. As a result, the weather events there. Those who now approach 3,000 accounted for transitioned in Morocco in the wake of the earthquake. And everybody who has made transition between the time we were together last week and now all the families, all the people. But these six, the Birmingham six, were killed by white nationalists. And so this week, there were a series of what they call commemorative events in the city of Birmingham. Uh, they had a social justice Sunday last week at 16th Street. Lukata Mujumbe spoke. Um, who's the director of the Alabama African American Civil Rights Sites Commission? Uh, Dr. Freeman Rabowski, Birmingham, born and bred, former president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Beautiful brother, beautiful brother, mathematician by training. Uh, he spoke last Sunday as well at the Ballard House in Birmingham. And then they had a series of events. Uh, they did events at Bethel Baptist Church. 
Uh, there was a running exhibit at the A.C. Gaston site, uh, the motel on Fifth Avenue there, north in Birmingham. Daoud Bay. I'll come back to Daoud Bay in a moment because if you go into the archive of In Class, uh, we talked about Daoud Bay's Birmingham Project and the book called The American Project. I didn't even look for it because I want to, again, same thing, you know, reinforcing something you said earlier, Pro. For folk who are new to our rhythm, new to and if you're in narrative, you've joined since we 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 did the long conversation about Birmingham and about this story and this this series of events we talked about. You know, you can go into the archive and see the fuller conversation with all the books and, and all the kind of conversation that, that folds around it. Um, and if you're watching on YouTube now and, you know, you haven't been joining yet a part of narrative, just know that we talked about this extensively, including a number of books. And I still encourage people to read Sarah Collins Randolph's book, The Fifth Little Girl. Sarah Collins Randolph, of course, the sister of Addie Mae Collins, who was right there with her. In fact, um, she said, you know, the the last image I saw before the explosion was my sister helping to adjust a bow on the white cotton dress of one of the other girls. And then the lights went out. And what Daoud Bey, one of our great photographers and culture keepers, cultural meaning makers says, that is that his parents had a book in their home called The Movement. Uh, the words were by Lorraine Hansberry with a number of different photographs. Photographs were taken by a brother who ended up marrying uh, the following year after he took that photograph of Sarah Collins with the cotton patches on her eyes, the famous bitch, she's in the hospital with these two patches of cotton. She lost one eye. Cotton, cotton swabs over her eyes because she couldn't see. She's blinded by the, the explosion. That brother ended up marrying, um, marrying, uh, what's the sister's name from Cambridge, Maryland. It'll come to me in a minute. She just made transition in 99. Um, Richardson, Gloria Richardson. Uh, but at any rate, Daoud Bay said, as a little boy in my house, my parents had that book. And I remember seeing the picture of Sarah Randolph and Sarah at that point, Collins. And that's when I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to capture images. I wanted images. I wanted that work to be my work. And he says, that's when I knew this is the kind of thing I want to do. Because the effect it had on him completely changed the trajectory of his life. And he's such an accomplished photographer. He was in Birmingham at the Alabama, uh, the Birmingham Museum of Art in conversation with my friend Imani Perry, who uh, wrote a very interesting book called South to America, a journey below the Mason Dixon to understand the soul of a nation. And of course, America has no soul. But I understand why Imani would say that after all. I mean, Echo Press and them, they got to do that, right? Birmingham. So Imani's from Birmingham. She's born in Birmingham. Uh, raised a few different places, but born in Birmingham, Southern by birth and perpetual return. She and Daoud Bay were in conversation um, on the 14th. So uh, I guess that would be the day before yesterday on Thursday. And I was hoping that it would be the live streamed or put up later. And it hasn't been put up later. So if somebody got some connection with the Birmingham Museum of Art, tell them I want to see that conversation. It's only an hour long. Uh, and then... Um, on the same day that evening, uh, Eddie Gloud was down at 16th Street Baptist Church to talk about uh, Birmingham 1963 to 2023, creating a path to reconciliation. I love Eddie Gloud. That's my brother. Brother, there will be no reconciliation, sir. My friend, we should we should have more public talks in Nubia where we just bring folk in and let's flesh this out because I want to know what needs to be reconciled. Mm. I actually do know what needs to be reconciled. And 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 mm -mm. apologies ain't gonna do it unless your name is Jesus and you talking about Lazarus, you can't bring nobody back. So unless you can bring these children back, who would now be well elders, grandparents and great grandparents, unless you can bring Eddie Mae Collins and Carol Denise McNair, unless you can bring Carol Robeson and Johnny Robinson, unless you can bring Virgil Lamar Ware and Cynthia Dion Wesley back. We can stop talking about reconciliation. 
And what actually that's not true. You should continue to talk. Again, the African studies framework, we, we designed it so that all the debates and arguments and agreeing to disagreeing takes place in the governance formation, not in the social structure. Because this is not a conversation that this country or this funky white supremacist settler colonial world has demonstrated it can have across cultural lines. Multiculturalism usually means get down or lay down to whiteness. Put on some ethnic earrings and by ethnic earrings and bracelets, by ethnic ties and little kente on your lapel. What I mean metaphorically is I think Supreme Court justice, uh, sprinkle a couple of elected politicians, maybe even a Negro president or vice president. But see, that's like earrings on the white supremacist body. Ain't really changed nothing. Stick a nigger on a cowboy hat and some shades running up and down Boulder, Colorado with a bunch of other people, including his own blood son. So you can make millions. They said it's like earrings on the body of white supremacy. Go boss. But at any rate, point is this. The whole idea of reconciliation got to be approached differently. We can reconcile once you done left me alone. Some land and leave us alone. And the capacity to be political actors in a social structure that isn't diminished by your insane, evil, immoral, anti-human approach to society. That's why the UAW is on strike right now. That's why the, the writers and the actors are on strike right now. Organized labor is about the only thing can back capitalism up. And you steady telling people they don't need to be a part of unions. Even my friends on the left, as Gerald Horn would say, our friends on the left who would say that the unions aren't radical enough. Okay, so what would you rather them do? Uh, there's a lot of things we need to do to reform unions, but part of it is we need to understand that we have to organize, we have to mobilize, we have to act. And to do that, we've got to create a we. And I've seen no possibility of reconciliation until there's some uh, equity. And I don't mean getting us a job in your structure. I mean, leave us alone so that we can build out of our strength. Because remember, the so-called civil rights movement in this country was launched, maintained, and victorious out of the foundations of black institutions. Did you not hear? Justice Brown Jackson said, my mom and team went to Tuskegee. You're trying to integrate the University of Georgia, University of Alabama. You're trying to integrate Princeton and Harvard. You're trying to integrate, but you're doing it from black institutions. You're trying to integrate Little Rock High School. I'm sorry, Little Rock Central High School. But you're doing it from Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School, the black high school. You're doing it from Horace Mann, the black high school. So this week in Birmingham, there were a number of conversations around what happened 60 years ago this week. And it's my responsibility. It's our responsibility as teachers. It's our responsibility as teachers to make sure that our young people in particular, all of us, but our young people in particular, if we are, you know, educators, are aware of and get to sit with what has happened so we can have that momentum of memory. And I want to pause here, just not pause here, but just to emphasize the fact that this work that we're doing week after week, every day in narrative and Nubia, every day at this point continuing to build, continuing to have conversations. I was looking at some of the rooms, the, the groups that are in Nubia and the things that are being posted and shared, the conversations, the connections people are making is truly transformative. It is the kind of work, as the sister said, Monday night in office hours, it is the work that sustains because when you work out of love, then you are replenished, you are remade, you are rejuvenated so this isn't tiring work this is an exhausting work this is the work that comes out of love and so you know if you if you if you knew to nubian you're still looking around like wow this is incredible i see this me i see the teachers over here i see the, the builders over here i see the farmers over here i see the people i mean anything you can think of we're in the conversation the artists and the people coming together hundreds and thousands and then people in these groups sharing information po said this is incredible just know that that feeling doesn't level off over time that feeling just gets stronger over time because every person that brings into that space rejuvenates and allows us to work and so yesterday i was out hunting and uh for books and i got a message from 
one of our long distance educators in Philadelphia, my sister, uh, Njamele Anderson. He said, I'm in a barbershop. Njamele, because she keep her hair close. close. In fact, you know, Njamele look at my hair and like, what's wrong with you? Well, you ain't been to the ring. I don't see no scalp, nothing. What's wrong with you? You know, Philly Negroes are very tight with, they, with their appearance. And Njamele, that's what I said. I'm in a barbershop. Uh, the owner of the barbershop, Wands the Pool, watches in class. He don't miss in class. And I said, he doesn't put him on the phone. So we started talking. This brother, his parents are educators. He's a barber, but he trains other barbers. And he's an educator. And so he says, brother, you know how sports is on the weekends, man. You know, everybody want to watch sports. But on Saturdays, so Wanza, what's up, brother? I know in class is playing right now in the barbershop. He said, that's what we play on the TV. <laughs> so, Professor Hunter, he told me to tell you all love and respect and gratitude because these are the kind of moments. This is what we want. Yes. This is what we want. And, you know, and that ain't, that ain't the first barbershop conversation I had. I, I felt that when I tell you when I went home uh, last time I saw my mom physically alive, I was in Nashville. I went into the barbershop and that's what they said. <laughs> they put they put us on. on the, but now you in the barbershop on Saturday morning. That is a different kind of level of conversation. You know, is, you know when you asked me about Kataji Brown Jackson, uh, yeah. Jackson, you know, this this is what this is where where the freedom happens, right? No it's in the barbershops, is in you know, I had a driver that was like, I watch you every set, you know, it's like it's in these places and it's ubiquitous because it's everywhere, because we're everywhere, right? So when you say we, I know exactly who you're talking about. That's right. And it's it's not visible. It's not you know. It's not performative. It's not you know paid speeches. And you know we're we're going to craft these speeches because it's that you know there's an event happening, so we have to show up and we're going to give the speech. And then there's these things every year, and there's you know funding, corporate funding, and other funding, and there's an honorarium. You know this is. I can't even describe it, but no. yes, what you're saying. Shout out to all the barbershops and and uh, salons. Oh, salon. I'm sorry, yeah. it's salon. Good, beautiful when we show up, whether our hair is whatever state. That's right. That's right. Uh, but yeah, it's the regular ass people uh, no. who wanna wanna live these lives and just be mm-hmm. left alone. It's so you know. Good. And I was also thinking, you know, as I'm reflecting on the six, because I was taught it was the four little girls. We you all know? were. We all were. Bro. We all were. So I'm like. Damn education, horrible. <laughs> Thank you for that. But I was also like epigenetically, like even though personally, as I mentioned, I, I was born in love, which we all were on some level. But you know, I don't know the abandonment, but we know it collectively, and it's in our DNA. Mm. Right? We know that. I mean, they studied the the Jewish folk from the Holocaust and how they passed along that trauma to their children. What does four hundred years of that trauma look like in us? And then when do we have the time and space to actually? healed that trauma, right? Kirk Franklin talks about seeing his mother maybe twice or three times a year and having that wound, it never got to heal because every time he saw her and she would leave, it got ripped off again and he has to start all over. You know, that trauma, like how do we heal that trauma over generations to then imagine what being left alone looks like and what, what it means to build and grow as a community, what, what it means to actually pour into one another with love when we're still dealing with that 400, maybe longer years of trauma, no matter what island you were dropped off, whether it was Brazil or the Caribbean or like, you know, Central South America, it's all this melanin, right, mm. is rooted in trauma. And then there's this like how dysfunctionally how we have to deal with the trauma whether it's self-hatred or hatred of one another or just please, please love me or what, whatever that is. I'm listening to Oprah has a new book on, you know, beating, you know, the beatings that she received. And then this whole conversation around how we beat our children. She was born in, tra- I mean, the, the trauma that, you know, it's like everybody wants these lives, right? But the trauma that people have to endure and then try to find a way of healing to be quote unquote successful, whatever that is, even that, you know, is a made up construct. What a success in a world such as this, you know? So it's like all of these questions. I'm sorry. I've just been very. No, don't apologize. This is, this is what we're doing. We're, we're marking this very important moment in the way that we're having this conversation, because we, in order to heal a trauma, you got to confront it. And, and, and we have to sit in it the way we, we, we know to sit. So when you talk about Kurt Franklin, his mother, trauma is very personal. 
You know, I mean, you think about, you know, Maxine McNair. She comes to 16th Street that morning looking for her daughter. She said, I, I can't find Denise. Her daddy is the one who stops her where she can get in the church. And he says, she's dead, baby. I got one of her shoes. That that's never that never left her the whole time. You know, Carl Wesley, he's at the hospital. They got a list of people who have been admitted. And she he looking down the list and he's relieved because he don't see he don't see Cynthia's name. But then they take him to the makeshift morgue where the four of them are. And he saw a hand dangling out from under the sheet. And he saw her imitation class ring. He said, that's her. I mean, what you going to do? You know, I mean, what are you going to do? I mean, Cynthia Wesley says, you know, I just got a little pair of kitten heels. Just old enough now to wear a little half heel. And dies that morning. The girl's getting ready to go usher. Youth day. It's youth day. These crackers done blowing up that side of the church. They in they, they in their best clothes. Because they getting ready to go up and, and be on the door. Be in the aisle. Somebody starts screaming, be on the fan. Those of us who've been ushers know what that is. It's a health, heavy responsibility. They call them four little girls in part because the narrative is to say that they attacked our children. But let's be clear. They were not little, little. Three were teenagers. And so the trauma is real. And, and you know, when black people were telling Sherman and Howard and, and Rufus Saxton and them in South Carolina, leave us alone. They didn't mean they were going to go out and exact absolutely justifiable and delicious acts of vengeance against the white nationalists. What they meant was in order for us to be fully liberated, we need to be we. So we will interact with you on our terms. But even the narration of four little girls is to make them martyrs for American democracy. And that is some bullshit. Nobody wants to be a martyr. Nobody wants to be a man. Carl Robinson's funeral was separate in part. And in the trauma, her mom said, you know, the movement killed my child. 16th Street was not known as a movement church. They were the one church in Birmingham that charged when the movement wanted to have mass meetings there. They were seen almost in some ways in terms of class like Dexter Avenue was in Montgomery. This is where the teachers went. This is where the professionals went. So their, their direct involvement in the movement wasn't the same as the other churches, them hooping and hollering and gospel singing churches. You know, you know, this week sent me to the shelf, back to the shelf to pull a book. That's an excellent book. But again, really, as far as I'm concerned, not her book to write. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that. It is her book to write. A very powerful social structure book by a Birmingham resident, na native named Diane McWhorter. This is her book, Carried Me Home. Birmingham, Alabama, the, the climactic battle of the civil rights revolution. Of course, it's wrongly titled because if it was the climactic battle, we wouldn't be facing what we're facing today. And I'll come back to this in a minute. Dao Bay said, when I saw that image, that shifted the trajectory of my life. And he, in 2012, began a project in time for the 50th anniversary of these murders called the Birmingham Project. And if you all remember, if you go back in the, the archive and narrative, you'll see a search for it, search through it, YouTube, you'll see the conversation we had. I showed pictures from this. He, he used a form in photography that he called, the professional photographers called the diptych. So on one side of the picture, you see a child who would be the same age as uh, Addie Mae Collins, the same age as Virgil Lamar Ware. And on the other side, it's a split. So you are taking this picture in a, in, in a church, you know, in a pew of this little girl or this little boy or this teenage boy, teenage girl. 
sitting in a chair or on a church pew. And then he took another picture, a separate picture of an elder, a person who is the age that one of the six children would be had they lived until 2012. And then he puts them split. And so you see little girl, elder woman, little boy, elder man, teenage girl, elder woman, teenage boy, elder man. It's very powerful. All of them Birmingham residents. These were shot in Birmingham. In fact, they've just done, they've just released a, a, a updated version of the Birmingham Project. I ordered one from the museum. Once I was looking for the live stream, once I saw it wasn't live streamed, they said, oh, they've, they've done an, an, another, an anniversary edition, 60th anniversary edition. And so, okay, well, I'll send off for us. It'll be here in a couple of days. When it comes, if it comes by next week, I'll show it to you all. Uh, because it's got a forward in it by the mayor of Birmingham, Randall Wolfman. Uh, Morehouse graduate. And Daube said, while I was doing this project, Trayvon Martin was killed. And it just reinforced the fact that this struggle continues. So when Diane McWhorter's book is called Carry Me Home, Birmingham, Alabama, the climactic battle of the civil rights revolution. I know she's talking about the 1960s, but see, for us, this revolution started when the first person who looked like us put their hands on us and it continued in Africa. And it continues to this day. We're either going to remake this funky set the thing or the whole thing going to come apart. But there will be no compromise. There will be no reconciliation. How are you going to reconcile an ongoing crime? Crimes against humanities have no statute of limitation. We are here. I'm, we're having this conversation in English because of a crime against humanity. With all due respect, Justice Jackson. The struggle of African people in this funky settler colony, the struggle of African people in this hemisphere, the struggle of African people in this world is not to perfect a more perfect union. What is a union? There's never been a union here. To talk about a poor, poor uh, to talk about a more perfect union is oxymoronic. And that's okay. Because absurdity in some ways marks the human experience. But the question is, what you going to do with your energy? I ain't talking about killing nobody. I'm just talking about exacting revenge. I'm talking about, I want to be. We need to be. And in order to be, there's going to have to be a we that is organized around those who have been victimized. So, on Thursday, in my Black Aesthetics class, I showed my class the seven and a half minute video that was produced by the National Gallery of Art when the Birmingham Project made its way to Washington, D.C. and was on display a few years ago. And I mentioned that because I remember going down to the museum, to the National Gallery of Art, rather, on the National Mall here in Washington. To see the Birmingham project. And we were down there looking. And then and, and you know how they'll have often in these rooms, they'll have a little screening room where they got a little video talking about what the project is. And so I had I didn't know what to expect. I sat on the little bench in the dark there and watched this seven and a half minute video where Dawood Bay. I encourage you all to look him up. I'm sure that you know our regular folk have already put in the chat the information on the Birmingham project. Um I know y'all. Yeah, I'm glad it's not behind a paywall. No question in class. You know, we did that very deliberately. We want the world to be in this space. Um, yeah, Derek Bell was him, Jelani. Folks are making comments. I'm looking in the Nubia chat. Oh, yeah. People say, yeah, people say I was beating up on Deion. I, I love Deion. Deion Sands' personality is effervescent. But what I will never do, and what I'm still waiting on a response from, from those who would say, leave Deion alone. How can I leave him alone? Because it seems to be he got, he got more attention than reading and studying, uh, including probably among the student athletes in University of Colorado. But the reason only Monk is not about Deion Sanders. It's about institutions. I think Deion Sanders is great for the game of college football. I don't think, I'm sure my enthusiasm for him playing, uh, coaching and winning in college football is, is, is not nearly as great as the people in the Big 12 or the chancellor of the University of Colorado system or all them people who are going to get the conveyor belt to the NFL. I'm, I'm Sure, my enthusiasm isn't that great, but it's great. I like I like the I like the gamesmanship. Mm. But I also know that I just read in Financial Times. I think WWE merged with the UFC Ultimate Fighting. I think they're now like a what is it, Prof? I don't know if it's like a twenty-one billion dollar entity that they've created. Yeah, 
Yeah. And so, you know, all of us who grew up watching wrestling and thinking it was real and then got older and realized it was a show and that it didn't matter whether it was real or not, probably looking at the rest of us who perhaps didn't mature enough into realizing what big time plantation college athletics are and shaking our heads because you know so no i i don't get don't 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 please don't confuse you know whatever i might or might not say about brother Deion sanders as a personal attack and then to do with him individuals you know in other words you know sure do i wish that he could have you know stayed where he was and and yeah and and built that space yeah and then you would have seen the real reaction it would have been kiki and ho 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 and all the way you rich eisen you know encouraging you know laughing as he says i don't recruit players in two family home i mean sure i mean that would have been nice but some it just left it to somebody else to do i mean at this stage i hope when these sisters wins a national championship in basketball that might be from an hbcu mm-hmm. that you know i think that's probably our probably our best shot you know, come, come on, Bisons. You know, you know what's wild about that WWE UFC merger, two point five billion dollars. They had to lay off a hundred people. Like, I'm sorry, not, what? Yeah, none of it makes sense to to make the deal happen. They they laid off a hundred people to restructure so that they can make the deal more pal- palpable or palatable. And I I think about the law. You know, it's we live in insanity. So these people got to lose their jobs so that you rich people can make more money. And then it was a CEO saying, you know, uh, workers got to come back into the office. He's a billionaire this week, you know, a video emerged of him at a conference freely saying, you know, they've gotten too, you know, too entitled, you know, they think we need them more than they need us. I'm like, mother freaking, you can't do any of the work. You're not willing to do any of the work that these people are demanding, fair pay and wages like we live in insanity right now insanity i saw the president of the united states make comments on terms of the auto workers the auto companies making record profits record profits and you don't want to break them off a little something something that's how capitalism works they put their foot on your neck it put your foot on your neck. If it look, if it look, and, and that's not to say. I mean, yeah, I said, and somebody just said in the YouTube chat. I will say, Jack DJ Williams says, I will say, Jackson State has become a household nail name because those kids mention it every interview. Absolutely. Again, you know, uh, Paulo Freire talks about the surplus value of knowledge. It, let's not make a mistake. If you had it all to do over again, it's better that the Sanders family spent some time in Jackson, Mississippi, than if they didn't. Let's not get caught up majoring in the minors. So it's a beautiful thing. And yes, they will always be there. And I think I saw you, uh, Prof, back and forth in social media because was it Shadur? They probably wanted to stay. <laughs> I think it was Shiloh. I was wrong. I think it was Shiloh that wanted to stay. Shiloh, Shiloh. That. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was wrong about that. Yeah, but, but either way, they are not the only three black males in the world. And trust me, that you know hbcus ain't thinking about university of colorado even as i see everybody from stephen a smith and the wu-tang clan out there in colorado and yeah, i see all the football i mean you know but i also see the baseball players like uh, i read an article the other day where um oh i forget the guy's name he was a pitcher for the cincinnati reds and this was during the strike because you know sanders was active in professional baseball his career also overlapped with the major league strike one year as you, as you know better than i do prof and this guy was you know he was looking forward to being in the major leagues because his mother had no health insurance i think she had cancer and he was paying and then the strike comes and he's out of a shot at the pros and the league as he was getting to get pulled called in and now his mom don't have money she didn't have health insurance so they were in the locker room cincinnati locker room and he had decided to cross the picket line to be a scab so to speak and he was catching hell in the locker room and he said Deion Sanders stood up and said you don't know this man's story you don't know what he's struggling with leave that man alone and then shortly after that's when they traded Deion I think to the Giants for some pitching whatever he said I was only his teammate for a week we only no two hours he said we crossed paths but in that moment it changed my life he says so you know I might go see University of Colorado I support Deion in this story after story after story about him being like that don't smoke don't drink good brother take care of family i got no critique of Deion Sanders. i'm talking about a system see this is how black people get messed up we make it personal about individuals while these people decide i'm a, look i've already made a billion dollars but i'm gonna take your two dollars but but you but two dollars won't hurt you it ain't about the two dollars it's about i gotta crush your dreams see this is what capitalism does 
And it's about, I can take your $2 and add it to my billion dollars. Now I have a billion and $2, but you didn't need them $2. No, 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 no. You're thinking about this wrong. You're thinking about it as if money uh, is something that should enable all of us to live well. No, money is something I get and take because I can. Oh, okay. So let's organize then because you can't do nothing without us. Oh no, we got to break that. So let me get three of y'all who... I can lie to and say one day you can be a billionaire to break your union. And then I'll create a platform where I can just inundate you with images, sounds, you know, moving images and sounds that will entice you to believe that you could be me. And if you can't be me, that you can pretend like you're me. And, you know, that's why Donald Trump's so big in hip hop. right? I mean, so was anyway and still is in the mind of some of these twisted people who seem they seem that they don't understand but anyway i'm saying i'd say that in birmingham we see a similar thing at work black individuals plucked out and fit into a white narrative but they become figments of the white imagination that's why to this day we're talking about four little girls and not the two boys and all of them as martyrs for democracy which is some bullshit so i'm sitting in the little gallery auditorium the national gallery of art lights go down video comes up and Dao bay starts talking about being a little boy seeing sarah collins picture with the cotton balls on her eyes and saying oh, this i'm gonna take i'm gonna take pictures he talks about his career then he says i wanted to do something around these children and that's when he tells the story i i sat there i watched it about three straight times before i could get up because I've spent my whole adult life studying Africana and being an educator in one form or another. And until that day, I had never seen flesh put on the story of Johnny Robinson and Virgil Ware. These two boys that were killed that day in Birmingham. So Thursday, I played that video for my young people in my class. And I'll tell you right now, after it was over, we sat there in the silence. And this is a class about music, art. We, you know, we, we talk about the broader concept of Africana meaning making. So we talk about the common elements in African cultures around the world, including the African cultures of the diaspora. We talk about the dissimilarities, the things that have changed over time and space because culture is fluid. So we get into debates and conversation and there's a lot of moving images, a lot of music. You know, two weeks ago, I played, you know, a clip from Amazing Grace when uh, Aretha Franklin is marching into uh, the church there to do the recording. And James Cleveland is on the piano and then they sing, oh, Mary, don't you weep. And we're talking about correct entry and exit, which is one of the modalities in terms of uh, cultural meaning making that Robert Ferris Thompson and my others say, whenever you see African people convene for a cultural ritual, a dance or a music, there's a way or even a social gathering. Or there's a way you come in a room and a way you exit the room. So we're talking about the politics and the culture of how you come in a room to sing, how you swing, how you sing, it, how the choir is arranged. When is it appropriate to get up and scream? When is it appropriate to sit still? And so after playing that clip, everybody's quiet. So you got to be real sensitive in that moment. What do y'all think? And then just let them start having conversation. So many of our children, I say children because they children to me, so many of our young adults, some of our people have these connections. That's what, Prof, when you say bring your brick, we're bringing our experiences. We make this. This is the we, as you say, we know who we talking about. We just have to make sure that we all know that and then use that as our, as our foundation. So that afternoon, I said Thursday afternoon, I play this, 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 this film, seven and a half minutes. And he's got the images of all six of these children. And I'm just quiet. Tears in some of the children's eyes, tears in my eyes. Even now I get choked up thinking about it. And those of you, I'm sure between the YouTube and, and the Nubia folks, somebody's going to find that video. If you go to the National Gallery of Art, and type in D A W O U D Dawood Bay B E Y the Birmingham Project. Uh, there's still a page there, and you can see the video is there. You can see it. 
and I doubt there's any copyright for it, so you should be able to find it. But at any rate, and we started talking. He said, Dr. Carr, I never knew about the boys. I know he didn't. Because I was a grown man, never seen the story. What? Yeah, and I'm a grown man who studies this. But guess what? The story was in the black press. You go to Chicago Defender. You find out about these, these young people. But when I tell you that story is not for the faint of heart. Johnny Robinson, 16 years old. Johnny Robinson knew about the killings that morning. He was with some of his friends in Birmingham, in the city, downtown. The white boys decided they're going to have a rally to celebrate the murders. Johnny Robinson, 16 years old. Some white boys pass him and his friends in a car with a Confederate flag. They waving Confederate flags, throwing garbage at black people yelling the n-word and all kind of other races you know how they do when they riding by quick why don't you why don't you park and come over here and say it to my face so i can make sure that you have no teeth for the rest of your natural life especially since you're gonna vote white supremacists and not get any health care but they ride racing by so giant robs his friend start throwing rocks then the police come up to them Ain't see, they don't care about the white boys. Hell, it's probably their sons. But the cop sees Robinson, his friends, yells at them. Johnny Robinson turns around, starts walking away, then starts running away. And a punk cop named Jack Parker shot Johnny Robinson in the back. And he died. He died. Jerry Robinson died that day. I'm going to come back to Johnny Robinson in a minute. Because Johnny Robinson died because of the same white supremacist, white nationalist violence that the four girls died of. He just died a couple of hours later. Jack Parker died in 1977 of whatever the hell killed him. But uh, I was reading a, a newspaper article about this uh, kind of update, so to speak, on the case. And the FBI sent a letter to the Robinson family in 2010 with more information about the case and what actually happened. And in the article I read, it said, quote, consumed by grief, the Robinsons didn't talk much about the teen's death, especially after local and federal grand juries decided not to prosecute Jack Parker. The cop. Of course they weren't going to prosecute him. Reconciliation. It ain't over, Eddie. I'm not reconciling with these people. For my life, not safe in the streets of Washington, D.C. or any damn place else in this funky settler state. To this day, do you think it's any different for us than it was for Johnny Robinson that day? Ask Trayvon Martin, mama. Ask Sandra Bland's sister. And she came to Howard and sat and talked with us. Ask the family of Eric Garner, Laquan McDonald. Ask, you name it. Why do you have to say say her name, say his name? Why do you have to say Black Lives Matter reconciliation? Bruh, bruh, you smarter than that. I know in Moss Point, Mississippi, trained you better than that. I'm not beating up on Eddie. That's my friend. I'm just saying that I understand what happens when you are in social structure spaces where they don't want to hear that. This vampiric, parasitic social structure that requires of us a song. I don't want to think about it. Your trauma is your trauma. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being a black woman can you imagine being one of those mothers unable to protect your child? Can you imagine being one of those fathers 
unable to protect your child. So your trauma didn't end. It began on September the 15th, 1963, and it continued to the day you died. Can you imagine being a sibling? They showed four little girls this week, Spike Lee's documentary. He did a virtual introduction and they showed it in Birmingham. There's a scene in there, Sarah Collins. I think it was, I think it was Sarah Collins who said she's talking about her sister and how that pain endures to this day. And there's a Denise McNair's sister wrote a book that came out a couple of years ago, Letters to Denise. Dear Denise, I think is the name. I ran here somewhere. I couldn't put my hands on it this morning. But I think it was Sarah Collins. She said, you know, thing about my sister. And in the beautiful, poetic African sounds, the ebony sounds, the black phonics, ebonics, in that black sound, she said, looked, at that, looked like that thing just hurted me. Looked at like that thing just hurted me. Just hurted me. Didn't hurt me. It hurted me. When I think about my sister, I don't forgive a damn thing. Nothing. The more you remember, the more you realize that the forgiveness is that I forgive myself for trying to dampen my determination to remake this funky place because it might hurt your feelings. You don't know the trauma because if you did, you wouldn't continue to suckle at us to assuage your own insecurities and unwillingness to face it in this parasitic vampiric culture. So. The FBI updates the family, the Robinson family on the case in 2010. And in the article, this cat named uh, Gillis, Dana Gillis, FBI agent, met with the family because the FBI had this civil rights program to resolve civil rights era cold cases. And the Birmingham News gave a report 10 years ago, 2013, about the FBI civil rights program meeting with the Robinson family, the family of Johnny Robinson, 50 years after their son, their brother was killed. By the way, Kristen Clark was down there at 16th Street Baptist Church. Katanji Brown Jackson shouted her out. The mayor is there. Kristen Clark is there doing great work. Kristen Clark, that's Black America's attorney general. I know Al Sharman says it's been Crump, but somehow. Anyway, the point is this. You can debate. We can have a so we can have a governance conversation during office hours, maybe Monday on that if you want. It's no problem. But the FBI Civil Rights Division meets with the family and the article say um, Johnny Robinson's sister Diane said, quote, we didn't get no closure. We ain't got nothing but heartaches. Don't come to me waving no damn American flag talking about reconciliation. Don't put our pain on display like trauma porn. And everybody weep and embrace and then we go out in the street and the cop stops me and you stand aside and maybe take a video and then scream justice with my name on a t-shirt but i'm in the cemetery don't do it there will be no reconciliation but there will be a, some self-determination and a remaking of the society or there will be a crumble that won't emerge well for you and by you, I mean everybody who will not side with our common humanity in moments like this. It's very nice when we've all had a good night's rest in the hotel or flown in first class or even coach. Worn our best suits and sit up in the place that was bombed and very solemnly note and then end with. And that's look at the progress we've made because, you know, Justice Brown Jackson then went into the statistics of the number of black women who were on the federal bench. And all this is very important. But it's not a proxy. Because our people still getting killed. And it's a lot of people not in 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham. We ain't got no job. Who's struggling to make ends meet when you ask them to vote. They'd be like, why? Nothing changed for me. And you don't have a good answer. Why? Because if you put a politician in, in fact, earlier in my education in Black America class, this is a beautiful thing about teaching at a historically Black college or at a predominantly Black college or university or predominantly Black space. You have students from all over. And so I've got students in my class from most of the places you can think of. You know, it's 100 students in that education Black America class, 240 in my introduction to African American class and another 100 in the uh, Black Studies class. So we bring up Birmingham. It's somebody in there from Birmingham talking about the real conditions in the city of Birmingham. Sure, there's a black mayor, but what about them unemployed people over there? 
What about these underemployed people over there? What are we going to do about that? What about these foundations can fly and everybody to have a solemn week of commemoration and then maybe sprinkle a little triumphalism over it. At the same time, the same forces that killed those children September the 15th, 1963, their descendants, as you said, prop are doing it now. And so many people still alive. Dan Robinson said, my brother is dead. We ain't getting no closure. We ain't got nothing but heartaches. Why is the FBI coming down here? So they can suck at your trauma and grow strong in their belief that somehow they've done the right thing. They might even make a movie, a Mississippi burning. Or, let me tell you something. The name on that building downtown D.C. is still the John Edgar Hoover building. This is a book called The Gospel of J. Edgar Hoover. How the FBI aided and abetted the rise of Christian white Christian nationalism. Lerone Martin. Interesting book. Very interesting book. These are white nationalists. And they still white nationalists. I don't care if they hired five or six FBI agents. So funny, the vice president, Vice President Harris, was at North Carolina uh, Agricultural and Technical uh, the other day. And before that, she was at Hampton. And she called out the head of her Secret Service detail. She was saying, um, the head of my Secret Service detail is a Hampton grad. And they all started screaming and cheering. And then the brother came out from behind the, uh, the curtains on the stage and waved at him. He said, see, yeah, now you know. That's beautiful. You take a bullet for her. How do it free us? And there are arguments to be made that it's better to have Harris and Biden in the White House than it is to have Trump and his white nationalists. And I've seen that uh, Lurch Frankenstein looking Matt, whatever his name is from Florida, gets babbling about something. And they can really hold the uh, whole federal budget hostage again. And then, of course, time a table veil, carriage tuber veil from Auburn, who the great white nationalists of Alabama sent to the damn federal legislature in the United States Senate, replacing Doug Jones, who actually prosecuted the last remaining killers of those sisters in Birmingham and 16th Street bombing. Doug Jones was replaced in the United States Senate in the election. They'd rather have an illiterate football coach, a leader of black men. You know how they do it in plantation style football. I don't think the color of the coaches is important as long as them Negroes keep running up down this field and we make this money in the slave economic concern or the big 12, I'm sorry, the SEC or the big 12 or the big 10 or the big whatever. But the point is this, correct, Tuberville is now in the Senate holding up military promotions because he's against abortion. At least that's what he says. He's a white Christian nationalist. Of course, it doesn't hurt that the Secretary of Defense, Lord Austin, is black. I'm sure that's giving him many cheers in Alabama. But, you know, we talk about Alabama. Alabama got me so upset. Tennessee made me lose my rest. And everybody knows about Mississippi. God, <laughs> this, of course, the great Nina Simone. So I'm showing this video. And as I'm showing the video, I, I, you know, it went off and then I asked the young, I just sat there quietly because I didn't want to say nothing. I'm trying to compose myself and I'm looking at these young people and I realized they're trying to compose themselves. And <laughs> slowly somebody talks. Johnny Robinson. <laughs> Johnny Robinson. Sister said, we ain't got nothing but Hardy. Johnny Robinson's funeral was the 22nd of September, 1963, at the New Pilgrim Baptist Church. I had to go, I had, I had to reach out to Reverend Wright, Dr. Wright. I said, Did you know the minister, Reverend Dr. Smith? He wrote me back, Yeah, I knew him. Of course you knew him. I'm gonna talk about Fireball Smith in a minute. This brother, who was one of the Alabama Human Rights League leaders. Very important guy. I'll talk about him in a minute. I'm going to talk about Virgil Well in a minute. But, but I wanted to mention his funeral, the date of his funeral. That was a Sunday, September the 22nd, a week after the bombing. But that Saturday, the day before Johnny Robinson's funeral, Alabama beat Georgia 32 and 7 in 32 to 7 in Athens, Georgia. Bear Bryant. Shortly after that, when the University of Southern California came east and beat the tar out of the University of Alabama led by Sam Bam Cunningham, the brother of Randall Cunningham. There's a great book on this, Alabama versus USC. Bear Bryant, Hound's two white nationalist coach. He was either not a white nationalist. They all white nationalists. Either you're a white nationalist or a white nationalist supporter. I don't make a distinction. As Martin King said in letter to a Birmingham jail, which pissed off the white people who 
the white ministers, because after the bombing in 1963, some of those white ministers put together money to help contribute to pay for the funeral of the children. And one of the ministers said, as Diamond Werder relates and carried me home, says, it's not fair, Dr. King, to lump us all together. No, Dr. King said, uh-uh. And remember, we all read in Nubia last uh, year, we read, where do we go from here? Chaos or community. I'm sorry, this year. Where do we go from here? Chaos or community. And when we read it, we read that chapter on the white liberal. Your silence is complicity. So I don't, you know, I don't care what humanitarian gesture Bear Bryant did for three black people in Tuscaloosa or his ball players. At the end of the day, when he got beat up by that black team and that black running back USC, he went out there and started recruiting black people. And the highest paid public employee in the state of Alabama today is Nick Saban. That's not counting him and Dion's uh, Aflac commercials. My point is this. Our people still dying in the street. Reconciliation. Reconcil re reconcile that in Alabama. With Kay Ivey, the governor, saying that the federal government needs to stay out of how we draw our congressional district. Because judges don't know as much as the citizens of Alabama. By citizens of Alabama, she means my white friends and family. We're going to get them as one congressional district. Congresswoman Sewell was in 16th Street Baptist Church. Terry Sewell, fine congressperson. Busting her tail representing the black belt of Alabama. Supposed to be two districts with majority black. They was like, damn that. We're going to draw them the same way we did before and make the court strike it down. But we hoping Justice Beer. Hell, if you can fight the police and be white in the middle of the street, you can have a drunken party at Yale and pull your stuff out, put it in some girl face and still get to the Supreme Court. Allegedly. The point is this. You're a white man. This the world is your oyster, particularly if you're a rich one. If you're a poor one, you just wrap around dynamite and start blowing up black people because the only thing you have is your whiteness. And somehow, some of the American Negroes don't understand that this can't be reconciled. The only way you reconcile it is through strength, through self determination. We're watching this video, and I'm listening to these young people, and as they're talking about the very personal thing that that evokes, it made me realize what i had done and i said i apologize y'all let me apologize because what i didn't do is prepare y'all now i'm not you know there are certain things you got to do you got to have uh what do they call them trigger warnings <sighs> but you know sometimes you can't do that and i hadn't thought about it really quite frankly but let me um let me talk about Virgil Ware. Let me talk about Virgil Ware. Virgil Ware was 13. His funeral was the day after the Alabama Georgia game, too. Sunday, September the 22nd. And this being our community, there's somebody in here who knows New Pilgrim. Who somebody may have put it in the chat already. This is one of the things, many things I love about this. Who knows New Pilgrim Baptist Church in Birmingham or St. Luke? Not St. Luke's with an apostrophe S, St. Luke. St. Luke Baptist Church in Sandusky neighborhood in, in Birmingham. That's where Virgil Ware's funeral. So Virgil Ware and Johnny Robinson funeralized, as we would call it, in black community on the same day. Virgil Ware was a seventh grader at Sandusky Elementary School. I'm going to read to you from, let me see. This is the Atlanta Daily World. You want to know the importance of the black press, black people? You want the importance of narrative in Nubia? You want to know the importance of the hub and the Karen Hunter show? You want to know the importance of having black spaces, World of Martin's Black Star Network? You want to know the importance of having black spaces that black people own and control? It's the importance of being able to have this conversation in places that bring us in, the governance formation, our protocols, who are we to each other? This is the headline from the Atlanta Daily World, September 22nd, 1963, funeral for Virgil Ware, allegedly killed by white youth, set for Sunday, September 22nd. Birmingham. Funeral for Virgil Ware, who was allegedly fatally injured September 15th by two teenage white youth, is scheduled for 12 noon, Sunday, September 22nd at the St. Luke Baptist Church, Sandusky, uh, with the Reverend J.R. Hicks is the pastor. 12-year-old Ware was in the seventh grade 
at the Sandusky Elementary School, of which Mrs. Effie Sewell Scott is the principal. Ms. Scott described the seventh grader as, quote, a very quiet and Christian little boy. He is the son of Mr. and Mrs. James Ware of 236 DeKalb Street, Birmingham. He has one sister, Joyce Ware, and four brothers, James Ware Jr., Melvin Ware, Wayne Ware, Melvin Wayne Ware, Larry Darnell Ware, and Ronald Ware. Jefferson County Sheriff Mel Blakey said that the white that the Ware boy was killed with a German revolver, which had been fired twice. He added that the two white youth were implicated in the fatal shooting. They were identified as Michael Lee Fairley, 16 of 1129 Skyline Drive, and Larry Joe Sims, 16 of 1224 Forsdale Boulevard. Investigating authorities quoted the two implicated teenagers as saying they attended a meeting at the Midfield Shopping Center September 15th. That was another white supremacist rally, meeting up, celebrating what had happened that morning. Both were identified as students at the all-white Phillips High School. Ms. Carrie Dowdell, aunt of the slain seventh grader, who was a maid at Sandusky Elementary School, told a reporter that Virgil often came. Told a reporter. This is Auntie. told a reporter that Virgil often came to school with her about five o'clock in the morning to help her clean up the school building. Ms. Dowdell said she bought Virgil's school books and purchased the wrong arithmetic book. She added that Virgil told his principal, Mrs. Scott, that his aunt would get his arithmetic book exchanged Monday. His aunt quoted Virgil as telling his principal, quote, I know how to work my arithmetic but this will be harder, but I guess I will have to pray a little more, end quote. This is what Virgil Ware said. The principal was quoted, yes, you will have to pray a little more. Virgil is said to have responded, and you pray for me too, Mrs. Scott. Robert's funeral home is in charge of the body. Reconciliation. Don't insult your ancestors, sir. Don't insult your ancestors, sir. Virgil Lamar Ware, let me go a little bit more into that. These two white boys were riding a motorcycle coming uh, for this segregationist rally. Farley gave Sims the gun. Hey, man, look at this gun. And then when they saw the Ware brothers, Farley told Sims to shoot to scare them. So the white boy shot the gun. One of the bullets hit Virgil in the chest. The other hit him in the face, in the cheek, and he died on descent on the Docina Sandusky Road, Birmingham. And they charged Sims with first degree murder, but he was convicted by all white jury of second degree manslaughter. Fairly pled to second degree manslaughter, and they both got sentenced. So they were convicted and they were sentenced. They got seven months. Except the judge who presided over the case suspended their sentence and gave him two years probation. Virgil was buried in an unmarked grave near the woods. In 2004, they disinterred his remains and gave him a plaque. Put a plaque up for him. And I wish I could find the language. In fact, I should be able to face it. It's in, uh, because when they, when he got hit, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let me let me just a little bit more context about Virgil. Where he was with his brother James. Where were they going? They had just got a paper route. They're gonna deliver newspapers, and make a little money. They went to the junkyard to find a bike to put together, cobble together a bike. Boy, that took me back. I'm just old enough to remember we used to build bikes in the summertime. We get a we get a frame, get some wheels save up, get little tires, put them on, get our pump, whatever, we make bikes. Well, they went and made them a bike, getting stuff out of the junkyard. They riding the bike back, Virgil on the handlebars, when the white boy shot him. And he told his brother, I've been shot. James said to Virgil, his brother, no, you ain't. Just stop trembling. You'll be okay. He died in his brother's arms. Don't talk to me about reconciliation ever in your life. Don't you ever. 
because it seems to me that it's all fun and games till it's your brother, till it's your sister, till it's your child. Can you imagine the relationship between a woman and a man who have lost a child? Between a sibling who has lost a sister or a brother? So at Johnny Robinson's funeral, and I'll read from uh, Diane McWhorter's account and carry me home. The 16-year-old Negro boy shot in the back by the police was buried Sunday following a funeral at Nelson Fireball Smith's New Pilgrim Baptist Church. Quote, not only are we here for the funeral of Johnny Robinson, Abraham Woods said, quote, I think we can say we are here for the funeral of Birmingham. Martin Luther King and Ralph Abernathy attended, along with a mob of out-of-town journalists capping a week of funeral observances for Birmingham's young all over the country, from Foley Square in New York to the World's Fair Space Needle in Seattle. A simultaneous pep rally was taking place at the municipal airport, where Mary Lou Holt was about to depart for Washington with some United Americans for Conservative Government petitions to present to Burke Marshall and Alabama Senator John Sparkman, the ancestor of Carrot Tuberville. Klansmen had turned out in force for the exuberant Mary Lou, Billy Hort, of course, and the rival for his wife's affections, Hubert Page, along with N-Word Hall, a, wh a white man with the N-Word in his name, Tommy Blanton. Probably Mary Lou did not realize she was functioning as an alibi for those heading off to an important powwow at the Cahaba River Bridge. Anyway, she's really writing about the whole investigation, how they ultimately tracked down who did it and people responsible. But ultimately, what you're seeing is these are on parallel tracks. You see them white boys down there in Florida on the overpass prop with them Nazi flags giving the sea aisle? That's today. It's not 1963 reconciliation. Go chase down this pufferfish white nationalist governor of Florida and his friend rival in Texas and this boy up here in Virginia, Yunkin, the governor. These people never stopped. So we don't mark September the 15th, 1963, because we want to. We mark it because we have to. And when we have to, we're not marking it as a look how far we've come. We've still got a way to go, funky social structure narrative. We're marking it as a moment to sit with it. I was walking out of classes, class uh, Tuesday, uh, Thursday afternoon, and this young brother came into the building asking about where uh, a particular office was, student affairs office in the building. And I told him, he said, oh, you, 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 that, you that brother who um spoke at freshman seminar on Monday? I said, yeah. He said, that was stand up. Where you from, man? I'm from Harlem. Hmm. Plays on the football team. I think Champ Bailey, the great cornerback for the Washington Football Club, one time his uncle. That was stand up. That was stand up. I ain't never gonna work in no white space. I don't hate white people at all. I hate white supremacy. And I will spend my life battling it. But I, my life is not going to be spent as an anti-racist either. I'm going to spend my life as a human being. I'm a descendant of the people of Africa. That vast continent that is the birthplace of humanity. And when you have attacked us simply because we come from that place. When your retort to us trying to remake this place so that we all benefit as human beings is go back to Africa as if that is an insult. Africa is the womb that gave birth to your mother. To say go back to Africa, you should probably have never left if this is how it was going to turn out. But to freeze moments in our long struggle to regain the momentum of our memory and our humanity. As somehow we were doing that for America, the United States, democracy, a more perfect union is absurd even as i understand why you do it i understand but the question we have to ask is who gets to tell the story justice brown jackson near the end of her remarks made a very powerful observation she said we have to tell the whole truth i'm with her but where does the whole truth start and what does the whole truth include because anytime you tell the narrative there are violences of omission and one of the reasons why when Four Little Girls first came out and they screened it at the University of Pennsylvania Museum, I'll never forget because that was the first time I got a chance to sit with Wyatt T. Walker and just sit there. Now, there are people who accuse me of name dropping. I'm not name dropping. 
what I'm doing is reinforcing the fact that we are human in the world and taking people out of the books, taking them out of the documentaries and narratives, taking out, taking them out of the places where they have been made into accessories in this ongoing social structure monstrosity drama called American democracy and reminding us that every name we read in the books, every name that we see is a human being who has spent her or his life in our communities fighting and struggling with, for, alongside, after us. There's a reason I mentioned Jeremiah Wright as much as I do, because that man is giving his entire life for us, coming out of that rooted tradition, just like your father, Prof, who poured into you, just like your grandparents and your all your family that poured into you as the only grandbaby. You know, they poured into him, Jeremiah Wright Sr., his mother, his sister, his family, and so he pours into us. And all of us struggling in our flawed humanity to do the right thing, but one thing is clear, when you've grand yourself in Black institutions, and when you look into the history of those six children that were killed, hear the names that start tumbling out. Trenholm Elementary School, as in Council Trenholm, like Trenholm State Community College, the one time uh, president of Alabama State. The names that come Trump tumbling out, Tuskegee and Alabama AM, the names that start tumbling out. We heard Chief Lewis giving us another update on Monday night in office hours out of Mobile, where Africa Town is, and our sister Thea Zakia down there. They continue to struggle. The names that come tumbling out are the names of our people. There's a great book that when we were reading Barracoon last year, I uh, picked this up. It's called The Future Emerges from the Past, Alabama African-American History Culture, celebrating 200 years of Alabama African-American history and culture. You've heard me mention it before, but there are a lot of people here as we continue to grow week after week, month after month, year after year, who may not have been familiar there. I love they got the Sankofa bird at the beginning of it. This is by the Alabama Bicentennial Commission and the Alabama African-American Heritage Committee. You can order it. It's a beautiful, lavishly illustrated, almost 250-page book and the thing I love about it is, now, if you're going to do something, do it, right? There's a sister, Patricia Ford, who was the chair of Alabama African American Heritage Committee. And they were able to wrestle resources from AT&T. Y'all pay money on AT&T. Get them to make this, put together the resources for this book. And of course, it starts with the beginning. I mean, if you look at the uh, the cover of the book, it's got these pictures on it. Then they got a uh, a gloss of what those pictures mean about the cover. And you see the number six, Mobile, it's Olude. It's um, Cujo Lewis, Kasula, Kasula, that, that, that Yoruba man, Isha, Isha, Isha Yoruba. That's the sixth picture. They starting with Africa. See this? I like this. I like this because they start the way it's supposed to start, right? And there he is again. That's Cujo Lewis again, right before you get to uh, chapter two, Civil War, Reconstruction, Post-Reconstruction. They're not dwelling on the, oh man, I could go through. Anyway, it's a great book. I mean, it's just lavishly illustrated. You see Africans in Reconstruction building. You talk about uh, debt peonage. Here's 16th Street Baptist Church. The built environment. They got chapters where they talk about architecture. There's 16th Street right there where they were. The northeast corner is where the white boys, the cowards, blew it up. And then they start talking about higher education, K-12 education, how the segregationists came. Of course, there's George Wallace, who, who they were going to try to pin it on a black man. They, do you believe they tried to put pin the 16th Street Baptist Church explosion on the brother who was the janitor at 16th Street? So maybe he did it. You know how they do. You know how they do. One of my favorite places, Alabama A&M, you know, it goes through through the origins of Alabama, Alabama A&M. Um, oh, let me not start. I, I'll do one more. I love this Gordon Parks picture. Yeah. See, America wants to talk about the colored entrance and the white entrance. Right. They want to talk about the colored entrance and the white entrance. That's very important. But Gordon Parks is like, yeah, but let me show you how black coolness operates. You can have a color interest, but those two sisters right there, the little girl and the the the, 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 the grown woman right there, that's what you call style. You're about might say it tutu with an I, not it tutu with an E. It tutu, it tutu. I'm sure I'm not pronouncing it right tonally. Coolness. Anyway, the book is just full of pictures like that, but I'm going to begin to... Hold, hold it up one more time, please. Yes, of course. 
book is called The Future Emerges from the Past, celebrating 200 years of Alabama Beautiful. African American history and culture. 200 is on the it was on the this bicentennial of the state of Alabama. Uh, I'll show you the publisher here. Um, Whitman Publishing, but I, I'm trying to remember where I ordered it. The Alabama Bicentennial Commission was published in 2019. Correspondence concerning this book may be directed to Whitman Publishing. So you can see there. If you're from Alabama, you should have this book. I mean, there's a lot of things been published by Alabama. Printed in China. Of course. But soon to be printed in Nubia. We're going to say less right now. But the point is, <laughs> we got plans. We got to build the momentum of memory. And we got groups in Nubia of builders, people who make stuff. The sister who comes in, who's a licensed plumber, who's teaching plumbing in Milwaukee. The people who do architecture, who can build a ground from the ground up. That's how they built Alabama State. That's what I mean, the stories about, in other words, we're just recovering what we've always done. In fact, oh man, somebody, I didn't get a chance to, I'm about to, I'm about to go uh, close it out in a second, but there are no doubt people who know these churches. A lot of black, black people bought, I'm sorry, built these churches from the ground up. So as we think about this on this 60th anniversary of the murders, the six murders, we have to remind ourselves that we don't, we don't mark these moments to be sad. We do have to sit in them though. And as we sit in them, we are reminded that we have an obligation to each other, to those coming behind us or after us or in, and those who are in front of us. I'm saying that in the way they would say in Medinetri, as Mario Beatty often reminds us in, in studying the Egyptian language, one of the words for ancestors is literally those in front of you. So every time you go up in a church and say, I'll see you again, that means they go on where you're going. So when you when you see McNair and Robertson, when you see uh, Addie Mae Collins, when you see Cynthia Denise Wesley, when you see Virgil Ware or Johnny Robinson, you're going to see them because they're here. And, and that's where I'll probably just pause for now, because last night, i tell you what, Professor Hunter, and I, I kid these young people, my law students, every, you know, we're now in school, we're both in school and you know, everybody's back in school. And I can tell the difference whenever we're doing in class during the formal school year or when I'm in classes, which I guess now, I guess, considering freedom school and summer school is almost all the time. And then Kemet is a whole thing, too. I try very hard to make sure that whatever we're talking about, we bring those classrooms in. And every week, I was telling the law students this week because we just finished up Catherine Frankie's book, Repair. We're talking about reparations. I mean, just when you get our people together and clear the space for us to just study together and think the conversations and then the determination to act becomes unstoppable. And Wednesday night is about, we finished up about eight 30. We sitting there and I'm like, y'all just, y'all tear me up every week. You just tear me up. You send me to think. And I was thinking about Birmingham, but then, of course, the following day, Thursday, when I showed, you know, the video and then, you know, I have a students, my, my education, of Black America students have a, an assignment on uh, their, their vision of education in the African world. That's their first assignment that we're reading. We're starting to read James Anderson's book, The Education of Blacks in the South. But they have this. And the last section of the paper that they turn in this weekend is their personal journey. So all these students from all over the country and some of them from the Caribbean, from the continent of Africa, talking about education, their experiences, students who were the only one or one of only two or three in their class fighting to get the AP class or fighting to get the IB class or, or who didn't know about dual enrollment until it was too late for them to get college credits. And they were getting ready to graduate on the other end of the spectrum. Students who came from classes where everybody in the classroom was black and them talking to each other. And what you see emerge is the class sensibility, the differences in conversation. And I'm benefited from this, even as I'm making the assignments prompting the assignments the conversations come out and you get tore up but thursday dwelling on birmingham for a moment it was too much it was too much and by, by too much i don't mean it was literally too much i mean that the overflowing you could feel that ancestral presence and as these young people connected children from alabama 
young people from New York, from Harlem, young people from Oakland or, or LA, young people from Nigeria or London, young people from Trinidad or Jamaica talking about the value of education in their lives. Virgil Ware said, you pray for me too on this math. You pray for me too. I don't care about American democracy. I care about what Virgil Ware said to his principal just before a white boy shot him in the face in the chest. You pray for me too. Hell, that could be put on a t-shirt. Mm. And so yesterday, finally, as I was, I left the house, I carried some books, I'm rereading Carry Me Home, I'm looking for these other stories and I'm just sitting with them. And then I started reading obituaries because I started looking at Bethel, Bethel I started looking at the churches so I'm looking to see, you know, how long these preachers lived, you know, in Smith's case, he lived until fairly recently. And he was interviewed by, uh, I think it, the, the archive is at Talladega, I think, uh, Talladega, by the way, Talladega University, shout out to Talladega College. There's Jones and Richardson's book, Talladega College. Uh, that's where Deion Sanders got his degree. But I thought he played at Florida State. Anyway, point is this. The I'm looking at the obituaries as and I'm reading the obituaries. The, the same things keep showing up. The same segregated schools, the same HBCUs in Alabama, Talladega, Oakwood, the same HBCUs, Alabama State, Alabama A&M, the same congregations, then the same names of ministers. And then I'm looking at the same names of ministers that are in all the histories of the civil rights movement. These are the men. These are the women who were the ones who lived this stuff. And now here we are, university presses and academic presses and book awards being given to people who are doing autopsies of our so our governance formation, our struggle, and then running into a ditch and saying, and of course, all of this was done to make a more perfect society. And we're not there yet, but look at the progress. And ultimately, these were the real Americans. I go to hell. And in the middle of the night, the wee hours of this morning, it got real quiet in here. I looked at one obituary, one photograph, and I promise you, Prof, I promise you, everybody, in that moment, in that moment, in that moment, every last one of them people was in this room. When that sister Monday night at office hours said, love, is what reinforces our work and you work for the love. That's why we take these moments to remember because they never leave us. I will stop there. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm really speechless today started in, in a certain vein and uh, I'm, I'm just so grateful. I'm just so grateful. And the fact that, you can feel a thing when we don't know these people personally, mm. but we know these people spiritually. We know these people generationally. Like, and this is the this is the the job. If you can't feel that, if you can if you can listen to Dr. Carr tell the story of each of these individuals and not feel something, something's wrong with you. Mm. So I just I thank you for that. And the more perfect, can we be more perfect? Someone said that was a grammatical f up because perfect. <laughs> not, yes, yes. Perfection in of itself means perfect. Like more perfect seems. What are we doing? But I guess that's that's the the people that uh, we follow, right? Mm. All right. <sighs> let's, let's end with this. This brother. Yeah. So we, no, he, this is the minister that preached Johnny Robinson's funeral. He's a major force. Real well. Out. Martin King, and he's being asked here, and thank you, somebody in the YouTube chat put, that's Miles College that has this archive. This is Reverend uh, N.H. Smith. They called him Fireball. Dr. Wright knew him, Reverend Wright knew him. So they just asked him, is there anything else you want to say about this interview? And it's a very short interview. Let's just hear what he says about our obligation to tell our own stories. Thank you. Dr. Cover that you would like to just add to this tape. Well, and I, I'm, I'm partly to blame. The Birmingham story has not been told. Uh, you've had people to come in, want to talk to people, but 
To me, the real history of this city during this period cannot be told by somebody interviewing somebody. The real history has to be told by people who lived here, who felt the tensions of the time, who, someone who knows the meaning of, 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 of segregation at its worst. Uh, someone who saw the day-to-day -day situation would be able to connect events and this kind of thing. And to be able to give some in-depth uh, insight into uh, the attitude of people and the kind of people who were really involved. Mm -hmm. The real heroes of the movement have been totally overlooked. Uh, it's, you know, I haven't read anything with any kind of uh, justice, although Taylor Branch to me does a, a fairly good job. But you, to me, you cannot deal with history in the distance, you know. Right. Uh, history has to be sort of like, I guess this thing that Michael Jackson is talking about, his story. Oh. And to me, this is the only way for it to be done. Uh, I think in the Birmingham situation, you need a group to work on the Birmingham story. Uh, Alola Hendricks, uh, uh, Georgia Price, uh, you know, to name some of those who are still with us. Uh -huh. uh, James Armstrong, the Woods Brothers, uh, you know, to sit down and and what one may forget, the other would remember. And so that this real this story can be told. Because Birmingham to me is still a unique place. Uh at that point in time, or uh, in uh, when Birmingham uh started it was 1871 right. you, could uh, okay. you know people could come he, to this place you know to he's just talking about the city but that was it we have to tell this story no, no matter how brilliant an individual scholar is what what makes you choke up when you watch this man speak <laughs> we've all seen him we've all heard him you mentioned kirk franklin kirk franklin don't sound like that by no accident he sat in pulpits with men like that. So that whole deliberate, that very, I'm not going to rush me and thank you all. Miles College, one of our fine HBCUs in Birmingham. People don't know Miles College. We talk about Harvard, we talk about Howard, but not Miles. What chokes me up is not only that cadence, because it's well familiar to all of us, but when he said what Ayikwe Arma said in the eloquence of the scribes and the way of companions in the resolutionaries, this is group work. Yeah. This is group work. What what choke, what got you probably that must got you too? <laughs> before we hit um record this morning, before we went live, you mm -hmm. know, we were talking. Um, and this is where I am right now. Nothing gets done outside individually. Right. So, so all of the individuals that you know that, that they throw money at yeah. that receive the money, and I, I'm never gonna, you know tell someone not to get money. That's the argument around Deion Sanders. Of course, better yourself. Sure. Absolutely. But don't, don't pass it off as work for us. That's work for you. Right. That's your work for yourself or your family. That's fine. This is work for us because we get up every Saturday, not, not for a dime, not for any money okay. because the work has to be done and it only gets done. We were talking earlier and I said, I consider myself like, you know, lemon on fish. <laughs> a little paprika. I'm a, I may bring a little bit out of the thing, but the, the meal is the meal. 
and it's gonna be delicious. I'm gonna make it even more delicious because I'm gonna ask the oh, question. To bring it out. <laughs> but but that happens in community, right? And I know my role, you know, is a question asker. Mm. I'm gonna ask the questions. You're, You're gonna. Ask, that, but I mean, I, I won't interrupt you. But I'm just. Yeah, no, no. I mean, you, yes, I know who I am. But I'm yeah, saying yeah. in this in this space, yes. I'm here. I'm here to bring out more. That's it. I'm and, and get out the way. Mm. Do you know what I'm saying? Like mm. I know what my role is, and if everybody comes to the table, like everybody's not going to be the one ringing the bell. Somebody got to beat the drum. Somebody yeah. gotta, like we all got to do the thing to make all of us free yeah. and whole. It, the wholeness comes through us being whole and knowing what our role is in society. Everybody wants to be a star. Not everybody can. Somebody got to be Tito. Mm. <laughs> somebody got to be happy to be Tito. You know everybody. what I'm saying? <laughs> well, Sly say everybody is a star, but your star shine differently in some right. other way. You're right. Yeah, somebody got to be Tito. T Tito is necessary. You take yeah. Tito out. Yes, and, and to that point, yes, Tito's a star in that, but but he's not diminished. He's important. <laughs> That's right. You know what I'm saying? Right. That's right. His guitar work and his you know, vocal right. are important. <laughs> I want to do that. Somebody. <laughs> Oh, so, shout out to Catherine, uh, Catherine Screws Jackson from nearby Russell County, Alabama. Not far from I mean, I mean, I tell you, all the singers in his family, that was his mama's people. They was quartet gospel singers. Oh, man, somebody got to be Tito. <laughs> Who, of course, she's still here. Yes, and an amazing human being, too. I had the pleasure of speaking with him. That's why. I did. Really? Fine. Just lovely. Just lo and, and not about the BS. You know, quiet, okay. but... That ain't the one you're gonna mess with. Yeah, that's that yeah, everybody everybody looking at it. Tito ain't the one. Let me just say, don't you you want to F around and find out with Tito? That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> Very lovely human being. Remember how I said y'all leave Tito alone? She in the no. chat. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm I'm paying a compliment. It is man, a compliment. That's right. That's right. I'm it's paying a compliment. In this in this instance, I'm Tito and I'm happy to be. Listen. I'm, I'm gonna play my, my chords and sing I, my, my background vocals. I love I love being I love being Tito. You know it's funny I was talking to the new president of Howard, Ben Vincent, who was a scholar. No way anyway, this is real quick 30 seconds. And he, I saw him coming out of the library last week and this is my first time encountering him in person. I said, yeah, I read your books, man. He said, I read your mama's book. He was like, you read my mom's book? Yeah, your mama teacher. She got she wrote a book on you know teaching and and uh, he does a lot of work in the black presence in Spanish America, Mexico, black soldiers. I got some of his books around. Anyway, but I said my favorite is Flight. Flight is a is a story that Dr. Vincent wrote, uh, President Vincent now, on uh, an African American served in the military, segregated military flight. And he said, you know what? That's my favorite too. And at that moment, I said, this guy might be all right. Why? Because I mean, you know, you're writing about the important scholarship, but then it is the stories of the people who don't get this. That's that's why when he mentioned all those people there. I'm quite well, I'm not sure, but he made transition. I think Smith in 2009, maybe them people he named probably ancestors mm. who, who who got a chance to get those. We got to get these. Oh, this is again why newbie when we're in there, elders, please, we need y'all. Well, because of you, you know, I've reached out to, to Dr. Cat Adams, uh, because yes. of the necessity to have somebody. Uh oh, muted, muted. I'm looking up Dr. Smith. Um, I'm trying to see when he passed. Okay, let's see what he All right. Uh, Nelson, hold on. Nelson, Nelson H. Smith, uh, born, wow, born in uh, Bruton, Monroe County, uh, 1930. Uh, died September 10th, 2006. Six. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Not even a week ago. A week yeah. Oh, see. That's all right. But there are people in that in that community who still know that. Yeah, but this is the thing. You when you do the genealogy, which you do every single in class with cars, and people may get like, why is he naming all of these people? Because you have to ring the bell, That's you know, right. because they were important to his point. There were folk that were heroes that never got named. That's right. That young man is in an unmarked grave. Do you know, oh, like they, 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 they finally moved Virgil, but they moved him in 2004. And and in fact, in the in Kelly Ingram Park, there's a statue to four little girls, and then there's a bench with all of their names on it. But again, I mean, and and we name them as well. And you know, prop, this is one of the main reasons I'll say any all these names is because people in this space right now in Nubia, in there, they know these people. This is why. So anybody who knows any of these people he named, 
it's on us now. Right. <laughs> it's on, it's on, it's on, it's on us. These are our people. <laughs> no question. People are naming them here. So, uh, all right. Oh, by the way, uh, uh, Mr. Bloxon's memorial, uh, the temple is having one on Tuesday at two o'clock in the building they call the temple, the auditorium there on Broad Street. Um, it's going to be live streamed, but I'm going to go up. Okay, I don't want to miss. I think uh, Dr. Amon's brother, Sunyata Amon's brother, made transition because of sickle cell. I know there's a. a yeah, she was on the show just talking about it. Was she talking about it? As his next brought, thing, right? brought, and she brought reinforcements. This is what I love. You know, like <laughs> to be able to have a program where people are comfortable enough to bring on guests on your show. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> right. like come on through. She brought a doctor from Howard. You know, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The brother was sickle cell. Yeah. And, and we talked about sickle cell. Her brother, you know, it was so powerful. Um, you, again, that comes through you. So thank you for the introduction. Oh. You got to honor it. Always yeah. honor the introduction is one of the best lessons I've ever gotten from a mentor of mine. You, none of us get here by ourselves. Somebody helped, somebody, somebody made an introduction. And so yes. Dr. Amen was like, Can I come on and talk about? I was like, Absolutely. Ah. The is for, it's everybody's platform. Yeah. It's like, you're the people's professor. My my show is the people's oh, show. I know that's right. Yeah. So yeah. That was it. Yeah. So thank uh, somebody you. Somebody asked in the chat uh whether or not there's a word for perfection in Metanetra. I don't think mm -hmm. so. Uh, but with, with Mario's classes on Tuesdays in Nubia. So if you're there, you know, and if you have the full archive, you can learn the whole different language, him and culture. There's a phrase in Patajo Tep that, that translates as the limits of one's craft are never reached. So yeah, I, I was just gonna say, I would think that perfection <laughs> would not be in the lexicon because what the hell is that anyway? Right. I always tell my, it's a process. That's it's right. It's a journey. Like that's, that's not right. a destination. No one should be just striving for perfection as much as you know, um, you know, reaching reaching your best potential. Oh yeah. Oh yes, yeah. somebody. I see sissy. Says check out the teacher that slapped the three year old to the ground, hit the head, hit the ground three times. Teacher picked him up in Dayton. Did you see that? No, I didn't. I'm gonna ask Larry about that. Um, and thank you, uh, DGF six twenty seven Birmingham Times. Barnett Wright wrote Lost in History. Virgil Ware fourteen was murdered the same day as Birmingham Church bomb. Yeah, absolutely. You can find it online. All of those documents that I mentioned, the Birmingham Daily, the Atlanta Daily World, the Birmingham, the Black Press covered all of this stuff. Now, again, this is why. What you do every day, five days a week, and then on the weekends, and then it, and then with the hub, that's why we have to have our plan. We have to have them. Yeah. They, they were not, and, and that's something very important too. People, when people say all oh, the full little girls, absolutely. And what we have to understand though is that we knew then. This narrative that has been imposed on us is a social structure narrative. When you look at our sources, our people were talking about that. Mm -hmm. So anyway, oh, this is a. I love you. See you on on Monday. See Good night. you tomorrow. Yeah, um, tomorrow. Says Dr. Amen, and uh, we keep it moving. And on Monday, Doctor Black will be on the show. So I can Dan see. Black, Baba Omoto Show. Y'all gonna tear it up. Thank Monday, you. Monday, Thank Monday, you. Monday. Love you. Another you. Another you. Oh, another dimension. We all doing our part. <laughs> all right. Bye, Doctor. See you. See all you. Right. All right. Bye, everyone. See you on Monday. <laughs>